Welcome to the Solo Mo Show, a weekly podcast hosted by Corey O'Brien, the social media strategist at Heat and author of TheFutureOfAds.com. And I'm Adam Helloway, CEO of the digital marketing agency Secret Sushi Creative. Each episode, we discuss topics, trends, and tactics related to social, local, and mobile marketing. Our goal is to help you understand these topics. You can integrate them into your own efforts. Today is June 5th, 2012, and this is episode number 22. In this episode, we'll be discussing the state and potential of mobile advertising, some facts about mobile marketing, and how social media is fueling the food truck movement. All right, Adam, I think we got a couple news items to cover off real quick before we dive into things. So first off is the fact that we are going to be at Social Loco, which despite our inability to say that name because it's so close to Solo Mo, uh, we are very excited to be a part of that event. Um, It's an event that's been going on for a number of years, and uh, both you and I have been personally involved in it. So you know we're super excited to be involved in that and uh we're going to be hopefully talking to some of the presenters there bringing some of that knowledge back to share with the audience here um and you know i think hopefully that that's a good match for our audience as well so if you're listening to this episode and thinking to yourself hey maybe i should check out social loco it's going to be june 18th so that's coming up quick and uh you've actually got two more days to snag early bird pricing so it's 395 before June 7th, and then after June 7th, it'll be $695, but in my opinion, that is money well spent, because it's a great event, lots of great information, some thought leaders in the space, sharing things that you're really not going to get anywhere else, so if you're in the area and at all interested in the Solo Mo Revolution, we recommend you pick up tickets and go check out that event. And there is a coupon code that we actually have in order to get you an additional 25% off. And uh, I hope I don't forget what it is. If it doesn't work, go ahead and contact us at the end of the show. We'll give you our contact details. But it should be MP Solo Mo. MP Solo Mo. It might be MP Solo Mo Show. So I apologize for not having that ahead of time. But an additional 25% off. That's very exciting. And a bit of news number two is that we are continuing to syndicate onto Social Media Explorer, which is great. We're happy to meet the audience there at Social Media Explorer. In fact, you listening to this episode may be a Social Media Explorer reader who is just discovering the show via Social Media Explorer. So if that's the case, we welcome. And if not, we recommend that you check out Social Media Explorer. That's socialmediaexplorer.com. And then every Saturday, we'll actually have a episode syndication onto that network. So, you know, great opportunity there. We're happy supporters of the Social Media Explorer site and, you know, really excited to be a part of that. Uh, I think this will be our third episode on there. So Yep, so we'll be there. We'll call SME Weekend Edition. <laughs> there you go, the SME Weekend Edition. So, Adam, with all the noise going on in the background, maybe it's worth explaining where we are today. Yeah, uh, well, we are in San Francisco at the Soma Street Food Park, and that sounds kind of uh, weird, you know, a street food park, but it's really cool, actually. This is a, uh, a new spot that they opened um, in the South of Market area here in San Francisco, uh, specifically for food trucks. So the middle of the area actually has seating and heating and all that stuff out there for people to uh, kind of congregate and sit down and eat. And then they've got stalls around the outside where food trucks can kind of park themselves all the way around uh, and just be here for, I don't know, maybe a day or an evening or a weekend or whatever. Uh, it looks like a place that they plan on having the food trucks rotate in and out on a, on a you know daily basis or something. And so tonight was a sneak peek that we found uh, on Scout Mob? Yeah, so Scout Mob, which is kind of a a competitor to a lot of those daily deals, but their whole thing when they launched was that all the deals were live when you found them. So you'd load up their mobile app, and uh, you know, I think that's kind of appropriate given some of the things we're going to talk about today, that it was mobile focused, but you'd load up the Scout Mob mobile app and it would say, hey, around you, here's all the 50% off deals you can get or special lunchtime things. And the idea was to really drive traffic at the moment. So you could just activate your Scout Mob deal and send a mob to your place. And so what they did is they're trying to build up their own community. So they said, hey, we've got this opening of the street food park. Let's give a little sneak peek to our members and uh, you know provide them a chance to preview it before anybody else. I think this is actually the first nighttime event that they've had. They've done some soft openings during lunch where they've gone out and just opened the doors and said hey if people come across it we'll give them lunch but this is the first 
large scale event, kind of dinner focused. They've got a band, so really awesome opportunity. Um, a bunch of different food trucks we've already got a chance to sample. There's the, the Mr. Nice Truck, the Sunrise Deli, La Pastrami, Slider Shack, the Garden Creamery, and my favorite named Adam's Grub Truck. Yeah, and, and uh, believe me, I tried to, you know, use the, hey, my name's Adam, uh, you want to give me a discount, and it doesn't work. <laughs> all right, so all the other Adams listening, you can't uh, you can't get a discount. But the food was actually, um, I would say it's probably, out of all the trucks, got kind of the really most, almost unusual food, would you say, huh? Yeah, I think so. I mean, for one thing, they've got the thing called the Adam Bomb, which I love the name of it, I love the concept. It's basically a six and a half pound burger fry combo, and if you can put down all six and a half pounds in under a half hour, they'll actually give it to you for free. They'll give you a t-shirt. They'll give you all sorts of swag. But so far, 17 people have tried and none have succeeded. So if you're out there and you think you can eat six and a half pounds of food, by all means, take them up on that challenge. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> and they, for some reason, the shirts they're giving away are all double X. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, they only give it to you after you eat, though, so you'll fill it out. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about food trucks in just a little bit, actually. But the first thing we want to start off with is our infographic for the day, right, Corey? Yeah, so this was an infographic called Pocket Money, the Power and Growth of Mobile Marketing. And it was actually put out by a company called High Table. And we'll include a link to it in the show notes, of course, so you can check it out. But just to run down a couple of the interesting stats. So right off the bat, they start out with the obvious. They do a male-female split. Males came up a little heavier in mobile usage than female with 51% to females 49%, but pretty much split 50-50, which, you know, I think makes sense. Uh, when you're, you're dealing with 2 billion users estimated by the year 2015, so, you know, in a couple short years we'll be at 2 million mobile users. At that scale, it's just naturally going to start splitting 50-50. But then it actually goes into looking at some of the age demographics. So we've got ages 13 to 17 represents 7% of mobile users. Ages 18 to 24 represents 17%. Ages 25 to 34 represents 25%. Ages 35 to 44 represents 20%. Ages 45 to 54 represents 15%. And then rounding it out, ages 55 plus is 14.6%. So if you add that all up, actually 50% of mobile users are over the age of 35. And I thought this was interesting. Is that something you would have expected, Adam? Uh, you know, I think so. I think those are the ones that actually have the money to pay the, you know, because because many of these are predominantly smartphone users. Uh, they, they, I think they're talking about mobile in general, but more and more folks are becoming smartphone users. And because of that, there needs to be income, obviously, to pay for um, right now what a lot of people think of as an extra fee, which is the data associated with smartphones. So it doesn't su surprise me that much that anything under, say, the 25 range, uh, is, 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 you know, drops off quite a bit. Yeah, and, you know, the good thing is that's that's going to be a higher household in income demographic. It's going to be people with more money to spend and, and probably a better group to target for most of the companies that are listening to this show. So, you know, keep that in mind that when you're looking at mobile, it's not just the younger users. You can reach that older demographic with mobile. And then looking down at how people are actually using mobile, there was a couple stats that kind of stood out and I thought were interesting for discussion. So just running those real quick, using your phone for text messaging, that's 74.3% of users. Photos, 60% of users use their phone for photos. 40% for email, 35% for social networking, 31% for games, 25% for news, 21% for sports info, and finally, rounding out the bottom of the list, sadly, is 12% for online retail, though I would hope that percentage is going to rise because, you know, I think as we'll talk about a little later, it's definitely a shift towards mobile, specifically to retail. But the one number, and jumping right back up to the top, that kind of stuck out for me and I thought was really interesting is the idea that 74% of users are using their phone for text messaging. And this felt like kind of a missed opportunity for marketing because... You know, I really don't see a lot of companies doing text message based marketing, yet 75% of us are using our phone for text messages. So why is that a channel that advertisers and marketers have so far ignored? Was this something that, you know, you thought was interesting, maybe represents a potential opportunity? Or do you think that it's just such a challenging and personal way of communicating that maybe it's not right for that marketing message? Well, you know, again, I think I'm surprised that 74% overall, we're talking about across all demographics, um, 
is, is you know people were using it for text messaging um, because usually people were associating text messaging with the younger demographic and as we already talked about over 50% uh, are over the age of, of 35 not even 25 um, and so that, that's the thing that's a little surprising uh, even to me I think it made it, it may have made more sense had it been like say number three or four on the list um, and the other interesting thing about text message marketing is uh, that the open rate for text message marketing is very, very high. I mean, how many times do you get a text message from somebody and you don't see it or you don't, you know, check it out or see what's been written to you? It's very different than maybe, say, getting buried in email uh, or something like that. I think the reason that the opportunity hasn't been um, kind of seized for a lot of folks is that it, it, it's also, I think, uh, I believe to be looked at as quite intrusive. Yep. Um, and uh, it, it takes a real nice, subtle, soft touch uh, with the right kind of marketing to really get into that, um, uh, you know, in, in, the, in that, that foot in that door. And in fact, we'll talk a little bit later in our, in our lightning round short stories uh, about um, how Sprint did something very interesting recently using text, me text messaging, and I actually tried it out, and um, I think it'll be a, a tip on how folks could then leverage text messaging as a gateway to maybe doing some continual engagement in the future. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, one of the other things that was kind of nice, they talked about consumers responding to mobile as a preferred shopping method. And so, you know, again, it said just 12% of phone users are using their phone to shop, but my guess would be that's probably significantly up from just a couple of years ago. So, you know, the the it actually lists phone as the number three way that a consumer prefers to shop. The first being website uh, on a PC or laptop, the second being in-store, and then third being website on a smartphone at 14%. So it seems like there's a definite shift there, and, you know, I think that... That's, that's partly hampered by, by companies, right? Like a lot of companies don't actually have a smartphone optimized shopping experience. So it might be something to consider if you've already got a web presence where you're allowing people to purchase something, what's a easy way to test out opening up that store to that smartphone market and enabling people to buy on the go? Yeah, I mean, I think that what's happening is it's is is that mobile phones uh, uh, mobile devices are becoming an assistant so to speak to the shopping experience so rather than being the place where the purchase actually happens it's the place where people it's the tool that people use in order to find out research information regarding a particular um, a product or, or service I mean how many times have you used your phone for instance to look up a competitor's pricing or, or used it to uh, even scan a code a, a barcode uh, and last I mean, how many times have you friend, potentially been in a store, on your way to a store, uh, or even, I mean, again, it doesn't have to be a brick and mortar situation, gone, uh, thought about purchasing something and used your mobile device to ask questions of your own social networks and your peers. So it, it, it's definitely um, being used as an assistance, assistant to the per purchase, and in some cases directly in the, in the store, the location where you're actually making the purchase. All right, a lot of good stuff there. And there's actually more to that infographic that we didn't even get to cover. So recommend that if you're at all interested in smartphone adoption and some of the numbers behind that to check that out. And again, we'll include a link to that in the show notes. So let's jump right in then to the main topic of the day and something that we're excited to talk about considering the fact that we are surrounded by them, which is social savvy food trucks and how the social, mobile, and local revolution has kind of been heavily adopted by food trucks and used to just explode onto the scene recently and become, you know, a huge force in especially cities like San Francisco, like Austin, Texas, where, you know, it almost seems like overnight it's they've popped up and really taken over the food scene and I think driven in large part by some of their social and local marketing activities. So there was a, a great post on Mashable that was talking about how social media has fueled this growth and, and maybe there were uh, a couple of things in that article that you wanted to cover, anything that caught your eye specifically? Well, you know, I, I think food truck almost in a way is, is representative towards uh, a lot of businesses nowadays where many of the small and medium sized businesses are now being empowered by social media for marketing, by using mobile technology such as, you know, Square devices and, and uh, a lot of the other kind of competitor uh, competitive de payment devices and, and methods that are, that are out there, PayPal for instance. Um, and so 
food trucks, which have been around for a long time, you know, people always talking about roach, uh, roach coaches and, and, and things like that. Street meat. Street meat. And, and nowadays, you know, those those have really kind of gone up in, in class and quality and, and uh, the variety of uh, food trucks that are out there. And it's, it's really because of the same reason that, you know, there's been this ex- explosion in people being aware of many small businesses, uh, as I was talking about uh, before. Um, social media has now made it easier than ever for these uh, uh, food truck owners to connect with their audiences without having to worry about marketing to actually apply think context to like where they are and and, and when they are going to be at a particular particular location um and so they they've really leveraged that as a tool in a big way to help them do everything from again connecting to folks who might be you know might not know where they are at any given point to actually engaging with people on um uh, maybe during their off season, and and cr- cr- create creative ways of uh, of engaging with folks and marketing what they uh, what you know what they have available. Um, and so we we've seen kind of here right at this event just how many of these uh, food trucks have their social uh, ways to connect with them directly. You know, right there in front of you as you go up to get your food. Right. Yeah, and. It's interesting because it mirrors a lot of other industries in that you've got these entrenched, established places, and that's sort of your brick-and-mortar restaurants. And then these food trucks came in, and they were just more nimble and, and more willing to test and more willing to experiment, and in doing so have kind of uprooted a lot of traditional restaurants. And you're seeing restaurants have to scramble to compete, but, you know, they're doing things like finding the best location and I think that that's you know a perfect analogy to a lot of marketing and advertising where if you just sit back and say you know hey we're, we're big we're established we know the best location suddenly you're going to find yourself out 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 spent out competed out uh, thought by some of these more scrappy upstarts so I think you know the fact that a food truck is willing to say park at something like this street food park and say hey let's let's try that audience let's see if that increases sales or you know let's go down the street and see if even just a small change in something that we're already doing might help increase the number of customers that come across our brand so I think that's a great analogy. I think the fact that, you know, they're able to really cater their menu to what's selling. So even tonight, they've got this huge menu and a lot of these have, you know, 10, 12, 14 items on it, but they know what's selling best. They know what people come to see when they come to that restaurant. And so that's what they're actually sampling. They're saying, hey, here's our best stuff. Here's the stuff that we know is going to sell better than our other items. And by that, we're going to guess that you're going to like this more than a lot of our other items. So they're using a lot of data to intelligently cater their offering to that audience and say, hey, try this. We know based on you know how we've seen other people interact with our with our truck that this is probably something you're going to like. And uh, you know if you want to if you want to explore the rest of the menu, you're free to do so. But I think it's it's interesting that they've been able to sort of customize their offering based on what they think is going to bring in the most interested customers and i think that one of the things that the food truck movement here has has done over the last couple of years is that they've mastered the art of engagement in a way um whereas a lot of the um topics that we discuss aren't always about engagement as much as you know um i, I think we, we've talked about the people that seem to get the most from what they do the most return on their their investment into time and energy are the, those that really understand how to in, in, uh, engage properly with their audience and so we you know there's some there's some uh, information that we'll link to where shows folks like Ninja Snowballs out in I believe it's uh, Atlanta I think it might be or uh, I'm trying to remember Baton Rouge uh, where during the downtime that they have in maybe the colder season they reached out to their uh, to their followers the people that the, the audience that they built over time and, and actually did a um, kind of a crowdsourcing um Recipe, so to speak, so to speak, or flavors is what it was. So people were proposing flavors and and creating different flavored snow cones, and then the whole thing was to get everybody there to actually vote on which flavor snow cone that they liked. And just that bit of engagement. I mean, it's nothing revolutionary, so to speak. It, it, it but it was enough to get people out there, get people engaged, remind them that these guys exist, and uh, to get them involved. And so they really are um, thriving off real 
engagement with their audience. It's not just having followers and saying, by the way, I'm going to be here. Just like you were saying, they're actually listening to what the customers want, catering their menus a little bit to what they want, even moving their trucks to places, obviously, that are more heavily trafficked based on the sort of response that they're getting from uh, from their audience. So they're listening and engaging and responding accordingly, and their audience um, is, is, is responding favorable to that. Yeah, and the other thing that I thought was interesting, especially, again, given the event that we're at, and the location that we're checking out tonight is the idea that sticking together has its advantages. So especially for the food trucks, you know, they, they can go out on their own and they can try to find their own spot and get their own audience and, and go at it and kind of be the lone soldier. But when they come together and they say, hey, let's park, you know, six or seven of these in one place, you see that multiply the number of people that come to check it out. So, you know, I think we saw today there were hundreds of people and this was a, a prepaid event this wasn't just people kind of stumbling upon this this was people actively seeking it out and saying you know i want to try a couple of these food truck places so i'm going to go to the place where they've all gathered together and are sort of working towards one goal of putting great food into onto people's plates so you know i think we the sort of online version of this would be something like the deck network and and that's a bunch of similar sites have kind of come together and said hey we could try to sell marketing and advertising on our own but if we gather together the sum is greater than the parts and so you know the food trucks have taken that and said all right well we will we'll locate in one place and make it easy for somebody to kind of form a dinner out of all of our different you know pieces and bites and meals I think you could see something similar for maybe a company that wanted to go out there and market rather than, you know, trying to create your own plan and find your own sites, maybe team up with a couple of other companies that that complement you or are in your space but, you know, not direct competitors and say, "Hey, let's all team up and let's see if we can get better marketing rates or get a bigger buy or, you know, get more more direct integration into a website." I think that kind of teaming up isn't something that a lot of marketing and advertising divisions have done a lot of, but if you look at how well it's worked for the these street food trucks, I think there's definitely some possibility for looking for those opportunities and seeing if you can uh, you know, take advantage of some of those those potential well, kind of shared audiences, right? Shared audiences, exactly. Teammates and, and looking at it as, as all helping each other. We're here at the Soma Street Food Park in San Francisco tonight was like an early preview of the place and we're here with Adam Lee from Adam's Grub Truck. How you doing? I am well, my friend. Uh, we like the food a lot. I think at least uh, we, we kept talking about the monster atom bomb. The challenge what, what, sandwich. Is that a sandwich, was it? Yeah, it's, a, it's one of our cha- it's my challenge sandwich I have on the truck. And nobody's been able to defeat it, right? 17 and 0, man. So <laughs> and no one's been able to take it down yet. <laughs> uh, so right here, you're, you're hearing the challenge here on the Solomo Show. Um, we wanted to ask you a little bit, um, how long have you had your, your food truck so far? Well, I started the business in July of okay. last year. And then um, I, was, I, you know, I, have a, I had a job before. I was working at Stanford. And then um, I ended up leaving the job in October and went full time and going going out every day, you know, hiring like a couple people and I went full time in October and I've been going ever since. Do you use uh, social media at all, at all to connect with your customers? You have to, man. Um, I use Facebook a lot. Um, I'm trying to be, I'm active on Twitter every day. I'm not as probably as active as I should be. Um, but as far as far, Facebook goes, I mean, yeah, I'm on there like all the time, like at least two, three times a day. Easy. So it sounds like right now it's like an essential part of, of what you're doing. With being mobile, being the fact that you know, like right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna start coming to this food park Mondays, Thursdays, Saturdays on a weekly basis. Okay. But before that, you know, I'm still like hopping to different spots all over the peninsula, East Bay, San Francisco. So it's like that's what's hard. Instead of doing a brick and mortar where everybody knows where you're at every single day, like I have to let people know where I'm gonna be at on a weekly basis, on my Google Calendar, and then on a daily basis, let people know I'm gonna be in Redwood City, I'm gonna be in San Francisco the next day, you know, just like, or else they'll miss us. So rather than say Twitter, which might be kind of considered more open and and people would, you know, check out what's going on over there, Facebook actually seems to be working more for you, huh? It it, it does well, because I just, I don't know why, because I I, I used Facebook before on a personal basis, and I was just really more familiar with it. Like, I'm sure Twitter's a good thing, but you know, it seems like, a lot more people use Facebook, and then the fact that if you can have the pictures, it has a whole like page 
you can set up like all their pictures, people can see photos of your stuff, and then there's a lot, it just seems to be a lot more interaction with, with people, they, you know, there's faces that and everything. more engagement than, say, Twitter, right, yeah. where it's just kind of, uh, yeah. so, so have you kind of been surprised or seen anything that just, you know, uh, stood out to you through using Facebook and, and now that you've had this new endeavor since July? Well, I think I'm really surprised just how many people I reach on a, on a normal basis on just, um, as I send out a status update or this and that, it's just mind boggling just how many people see it. I mean, people may not respond, but it reaches out to like hundreds of people like all the time, even at like at night and the morning and daytime, you know, it's just like, it's just amazing how many people actually see it and then come to the truck because they saw it. So have you done traditional marketing at all or is it all pretty much social media and just word of mouth? Um, well, we, I've tried to work with, um, you know, um, a marketing company, but, uh, for some reason they just can't get the landing page, right? Things. And it is a lot, obviously there's a lot more overhead and expense doing it like that. Um, but you know, I have a website, but the website is secondary. People look at it to, for the menu and stuff like that. And people who don't, you know, aren't on Facebook or Twitter, it's easy for them just to go on the website and kind of check out where we're going to be. But that's kind of like, it just kind of redirects you back to Facebook and Twitter if you want to follow, you know. But, um, you know, we try to do traditional marketing and we have, I set up like flyers. So anytime I talk to companies, send things out to companies, I have flyers, menus, like we had a traditional type of way. But, um, you know, it's not as flexible and as and engaging as uh, as say Facebook for you. I think. Yeah, it's, you know people can see there's a lot more pictures. I mean, I don't know. It's just obviously the expenses is totally different. I mean, Facebook's free. So, so what uh, has there been any sort of say like influence in the interaction that that you have had with your customers on your dishes or or the way that you do business or anything? Yeah, what I, what I try to do is like you know I actually went to a couple of like social media mixers. And, um, you know, you get to, I, you know, I was one of the few people that asked questions in front of everybody, you know, about like, what do I say every day? Or, you know, the fact that I don't get responses back, you know, is that, you know, why would I do it if people aren't responding back? But they are like, you know, people are actually listening to it or reading it. They, they may not have time to respond and they, maybe they don't have something to say, but it reaches people. So always keep doing it and then try to bring out a little bit of your personality, have some fun with it. Um, but, you know, I mean, I... Some of my names on my sandwiches, I have Falcor from Never Any Story, Drunken Master, Jack Chan. I, I have an Asian dragon kind of themes. And I got all this stuff. I, I put out sandwiches. I name what they, I mean, I say what's in it. And I say, whoever can get give me the, the best name, names the sandwich, sa- sandwiches on them. I mean, sandwiches on us. Yeah. So, and <laughs> you get like 20, 30 responses. And every, people put some detail, like like meanings behind it and why they come up with it and you know where they came from and this is amazing you know like um the the, the people that that have something to say it's just you know all the interaction i just say okay name the sandwich you know, you know it's just like it's fun then people look at the challenge sandwich i put post that and people are like oh i have somebody i can do i'm gonna, I'm gonna send somebody over there you know it's just like that's that's what i wanted you know that's what i wanted to have is like really positive interaction because I want to be somewhat different not just say oh this is what I'm going to be so does that help you drive you a bit as well because you, you can see that there's actually people out there that are interested even before you get to a particular place and and have a line form or you yeah. know or something like that that's the that's the amazing thing about it is that people get engaged and they want to they want to root for you and I feel like more than just um, you know just telling people where I'm at and maybe they just like our food but if they like who we are who, who maybe who I am or who, who the business what the business is about that they can kind of root for us not only support us because they like the food but support us because you know these guys like to have you know this guy likes to have fun he, he cares about people you know like I'll say like oh you know um, you know I'll try to you know if you wrote something I'll write back I write back to everybody and I'll either I'll like your comment or I'll talk to you and try to like you know just encourage you to like have a great day thanks for coming out just like show support and people like that because you're taking the time out because we're all busy. I mean, we're all freaking hella busy, but you know, people like the interaction, you know, everybody's social, right? Social media. So, so two last things here before we finish. One is, uh, if there would be something that you have a, a problem with in relations to, you know, social media or, uh, that you'd like to understand better, what would that be that you think would help your business? Well, I think, um, you know, I know there's like tutorials, but you know, 
who really has time to go through tutorials about how to really use it the best possible way. Um, and I, I don't know if I'm doing that. And then, um, you know, I Twitter, I just don't know. Like LinkedIn, stuff like that. So it's I, have no, I have no, I have no, I have no idea how to use LinkedIn. So it's being a busy, a, bu- a busy business owner and trying to actually understand how yeah, to use. I just want to be properly. simple. For me, it'd be like I want to have somewhere where right on the first page it tells exactly where we're going to be for like the next week or two, and then like some pictures. It has that um, little thing about us, and then you know, you know, just where we're going to be and you know who we are. But you know, like Twitter, you know. I'll, to me, all it is is just like blurbs, you know, short little blurbs. And I just, I can't come up with this stuff like all the time. Like every day I'm like, what am I going to say today that's going to be different? I don't, I don't have a catchphrase. So, so kind of the lesson learned there is that, you know, you, you're, you're using what you feel comfortable with and you're finding some results. And maybe in due time you'll find a, a way to use some of these other tools. But at the moment you're really sticking with what's familiar with. Yeah, you. you're just sticking with what you're familiar with. But at the same token, you know it could be better. But you just don't have the time to actually like learn how to do it so then my last question to you is is how can people find you on facebook and your website well if they like us on facebook so my mistake is i opened up a adam's grub drug personal page so that doesn't have the like option doesn't have the, the schedule and stuff like that but you know it's you can do a lot of interactions and stuff like that like that but um if you like us on our business page adam's grub truck then you can follow our schedule know where we're going to be all the time and then um you know twitter you know, at Adam's Grub Truck and then my website, adamsgrubtruck.com. Awesome. So, awesome. But we're right, going to be mainly in San Francisco and the peninsula. So, and, a lot. Uh, and here. And I think the moral of the story really is is that there's a lot of people, especially in the food truck uh, industry, who are individual, passionate people about, you know, like you, who have started this as kind of their own business and who are feeding off of uh, uh, engaging with their audience um, to kind of develop your business and then ultimately connect with folks in order to come out and buy some food and enjoy them. That's that's the whole reason I did the truck and I thought that I would be good at this because you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world and then I, you know, I was just like I like talking to people. I like making people happy. I like seeing people's reactions when they see the names of the truck of the the sandwiches or like when kids look at the dragons they're like, "Oh, I like the dragon, the dragon truck." You know, I just like to have fun and meet people. And obviously, you know, meeting women is also great. I got a couple numbers today. You know, stuff like that. You know, and you just meet a lot of great people and you have fun. And look, I'm staying longer than anybody else. Whatever. It's just fun meeting people, talking to you guys. You know, it's the best thing. Well, cool. We liked your food. I'm not up to the challenge just yet for your <laughs> Adam Bomb. But uh, but good luck, man. Thanks, uh, hopefully Adam. we'll check you out over here. And yeah, you know, I tried to get a discount just because my name was Adam, but didn't work out just yet. I'll have to yeah, I'll work on Don't that. worry about it, man. <laughs> Don't worry about it. All right. Take care, man. All right. Thanks a lot, Adam. We're here with Carlos, who is the founder of Street Food Park, and uh, you know I think Adam and I enjoyed ourselves. We had a great time, but just wondered if you could give us a quick rundown of what Street Food Park is and what you're hoping to accomplish here. All right, so uh, welcome. This is the Soma Street Food Park. Uh, we have we're basically a, a pod or, or a park for mobile food vendors, street food vendors, uh, basically startup entrepreneurs to come and, and showcase their you know what they do best and uh the trucks will be rotating in and out um so there'll be different cuisines here on a daily basis uh even on a on a, on a day like a lunch there'll be different vendors and possibly on the dinner time so you know we just wanted to create a space where all of these guys can come together and and really you know showcase what they do and um basically have a place to do business because right now all the the, the laws and the rules behind mobile vending and, and getting their permits for the streets is complete just complete hectic like it doesn't make sense and it's impossible for them to get any business anywhere so we created a space that you know where they can be happy where brick and mortars can be happy i think is a great way for this to coexist um it works really well in portland works really well in austin and it's you know something that we wanted to recreate here in san francisco why do you think um that the mobile food vending and food trucks have just kind of blossomed over the last couple years um i just think it's you know you're, you it's basically it gives the, it's a platform for these vendors to do something creative to um you know and just the whole uniqueness of being outdoors and um you know you're 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 meeting the guy cooking your food and you, he's talking to you about his product and where he gets his stuff from and you know he 
and it's just just the whole uniqueness and it just serves as a platform they're doing really creative things that you don't really get in other restaurants you know because of the the way that they just the platform that it creates you know i know guys doing irish Eritrean fusion like there's no way there would ever be a restaurant like that so i just think the uniqueness and just the um you know the one-on-one interaction with the owner you know chef is what really moves us how can people find out uh more about the the food park and what you guys are doing and maybe like what trucks are going to be here on a particular day definitely we'll have um schedules up on the website definitely with through twitter and facebook what's the website uh the website is www.somastreetfoodpark.com and um, so we'll be updating the schedule, you know, via Twitter, via Facebook. Um, the truck vendors themselves all use social media and um, letting them know who's, you know, them themselves will tell their followers when they're here. So uh, I think it's just exponentially, it just, you know, grows. And, and um, it's been a really great feedback in the community. We had a fun time. We got here actually before everybody got here and, uh, and, and watched the crowd just, just grow. I mean, they think we're pretty happy, right, Corey, that we got here ahead of time because we kind of hit four trucks. And then suddenly every single truck just had a line just kind of going, uh, I wouldn't say down the block because we're all here on the block anyways, but a lot of people here. So I think you guys um, are, are well off on, uh, on the event. It was a success. I think. Thank you. I appreciate it. I think so. There's a lot of happy, happy faces in the in the crowd. So All right, we're so happy. Soma Street S C R E A T F O O D and park right dot com and uh, you'll probably also be able to find Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff there as well. So you guys definitely should check it out if you're in the San Francisco area. Thanks. Thank you. So, Corey, it was pretty cool talking to the folks out there at the Soma Street Food Park. And I think we'll get a chance to go out there again sometime and hang out with the folks. Uh, And it was interesting to see all of the different trucks with all their social stuff proudly displayed. Uh, but now we're back in our own home studios here. Uh, we we kind of got kicked out of the street park because we were uh, the street food park because we were we, we we were first to show up and we were the last to to leave in a way after we were interviewing folks. So uh, we're going to continue with the rest of the show here. Yeah, a little little warmer, a little quieter. So uh, let's dive right into our next topic, which is really just a general talking about mobile marketing. We've noticed a lot of trends and a lot of news stories coming out lately about the rise of mobile and especially how that relates to the way that companies are marketing and advertising to consumers. So we figured let's find a couple of stories, let's see a couple of things that we want to touch upon and and do, you know, a, a good solid dive into mobile marketing. And so I think first up on the plate was a recent presentation from Mary Meeker, and there were quite a bit of interesting statistics that came out of this, and this is going to be one of those studies that you'll see often quoted or even repurposed for people's pitch decks and and their own presentations moving forward. I think this is one of those things that people are going to point to and say, all right, this is the data that I'm now basing my idea off of. So... It's a 100-page-plus slide deck. Highly recommend that if you have the chance... And we're about to cover every single page for you right <laughs> we now. We are going to read it verbatim, exactly. Uh, no, but I, I do recommend that if you have a chance to actually take a look. It's not as intimidating as the 100 pages would make it sound. There are quite a few pages that are pretty quick hits, but uh, we'll include a link to it in the show notes, so I encourage you to check that out. But what we're going to do here is actually try to distill down just a couple of the most important bits of information that we got from reading through this and and how that could potentially affect the marketing and advertising that you're going to be doing as it pertains to mobile. So, Adam, why don't you uh, kick things off with a couple stats that you uh, thought were interesting or that caught your eye? Sure. So uh, one of the first things was kind of a a combination of of two um, two slides where uh, essentially that mobile internet traffic itself is is on the rise. And so uh, from uh, less than half of what it is at the moment right now, uh, we're at close to 10% um, at this moment. And a couple years ago, we were at 4% of the total, uh, I think this one was global internet traffic um, was from mobile devices. And in most cases, folks are, are also including um, tablets but uh, but for the most part, usually the lion's share of it are, are smartphones, and so the there's a there's there's a been a, a dramatic increase 
in uh, or somewhat dramatic increase in mobile traffic in comparison to the entire um, uh, the bulk the the, the 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 total of internet traffic currently, and it, it, it's likely to continue to increase, and eventually it will likely be, I mean, I don't know what it'll be, whether it be a year from now or three years from now or 10 years from now, I would say in under a decade, I wouldn't be surprised, and maybe, Corey, you could t- toss your estimation in here and your guess, that maybe even potentially within five to eight years, that mobile traffic could actually maybe be neck and neck with desktop traffic? What do you think? Yeah, well, it's interesting because this chart is actually looking at global traffic. And so my guess would be that if you did this same chart but just looked at the U.S.-based traffic, which is what I'd imagine a lot of our listeners are going to be targeting, I'm guessing that it's way higher than 10% at this point. You know, you, you think about the number of people you see walking around face buried in their phone and they're they're browsing the Internet, they're posting things to Facebook – you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the U.S. mobile traffic is already somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 percent of the full amount of Internet traffic. So, you know, looking at this chart here, it's really a 4 percent to 10 percent jump over the course of I think it's like 16 months. That's just, you know, incredible growth. And so, again, if if that's if you're looking at a 6 percent jump in just 16 months, then getting the rest of the way there yeah, I would say five years out would be my guess. So we're looking at 2017 is my official prediction for when mobile traffic and desktop traffic reach the same level as one another, which is really an incredible shift. And I think, you know, essentially demands that you pay attention to it and demands that you start to formulate ideas around how you could take advantage of that shifting trend in consumer behavior. Um, and so... You know, one of the other slides that I thought was really interesting was looking at media and media dollars as it compares to the amount of time we're actually spending on various forms of entertainment. So what the slide was doing is comparing, you know, how much time we spend on things like print, radio, TV, Internet and mobile phones versus how much money advertisers are paying to reach those various networks. And so something like television, which been which has been around for, you know, a long time now, really has established buying principles. Basically, we're spending 43% of our average day watching television, or I'm sorry, our average total media consumption watching television, and advertisers are spending 42%. So just 1% difference comparing the amount of time we spend to the amount of money that advertisers are spending to reach us there. So it means it's saturated, right? It's, just, it's not like you ever watch a TV show and they go, you know what? We normally have a commercial here, but we're not going to put one because we don't have a commercial to put. Exactly. It, it, it's saturated. It's completely saturated in that sense. And not to say that it's not effective, but but that's just it. it it's, 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 a, it's a saturated market. Yeah. And so compare that then to mobile where – According to this chart, 10% of our typical media consumption is done on a mobile device, but currently advertisers are only spending 1% of their total ad spend on mobile. So there's this huge difference in terms of the amount of time we're spending compared to the amount of money that's being spent to actually target ads against that time. And so, you know, what this tells me is that over the the next couple of years, we're just going to see this huge influx in mobile advertising as advertisers say, hey, wait a minute, there's... There's an opportunity here, you know, there's there is more supply than demand and so we're getting better rates, we're getting better targeting, we're getting better deals. Let's start to shift some of that money into mobile and I think where it's going to come from is print. So you look at print, 7% of our media consumption comes from print. So it's actually less than mobile. And it's been down from from the years over, you know, years past essentially based on this data here. Yeah, dropping and then 25% of ad spend is actually going towards print. So nearly actually yeah, nearly four times the amount of time spent in terms of percentages is how much is being spent. So the smart advertiser, the smart marketer is going to say we're way overspending on print, you know, print is sort of slowly dying and I think it's, you know, everybody sort of acknowledged that and there's certain areas that are still surviving, but on the whole print is dying. So the smart money is take it out of print, put it into mobile. Yeah, and uh, they're they're basically on the slide here saying that it's a twenty billion dollar opportunity 
uh, in the U.S. alone uh, to, for mobile advertising. Um, and so we, we've been kind of thinking about how people might take advantage of this a, a little bit. And, you know, what would you say people should be thinking about at the moment to potentially seize this opportunity? And what, actually, the, the question I wanted to ask you first was, um, do you think mobile advertising in, in the sense in comparison to internet advertising, which, you know, essentially could be desktop uh, for the most part or is associated with desktop com- computing and, and media consumption. Um, do you see it as uh, mobile as better or worse than desktop internet uh, advertising? Um, and in either case, why? So I think it's a good question. And the reason it's good is because it's challenging. So What's better about mobile advertising is that it's harder to ignore, to be to be quite frank. So as a user, to me, that's that's frustrating. But as an advertiser and as a marketer, you're like, this is perfect. You know, it's a limited screen space. You can put your your ad there. It's typically the only ad on the screen. You know, ideally, it's it's not taking over the content that's on the screen, but it gets pretty prominent real estate. So it's a lot better than a desktop experience where, you know, you load up a typical site nowadays and there could be 20, 30 ads or, or things that look like ads taking over this site. And so you're sort of lost in the shuffle versus mobile. It's a very fixed real estate. And so you, you've got this space, you've got your brand message. You can be very clear because you're not trying to fight amongst, you know, six or seven ads to say, Hey, look at mine. Mine's the biggest, mine's the brightest you can be a little more subtle with your message and just say, hey, here's the benefit of my product. Here's why I think you should click this banner or this button to learn more. So from that sense, I like it. Um, from the user sense, I you know, I tend to prefer paid apps because I, I don't want to see advertising. I don't want my already limited screen real estate to be taken over by you know, ads for things that may or may not be interesting to me. So, you know, I... I sort of see the benefits, but I also see the challenges as a user where I I want to keep mobile as pure as possible from a user's perspective. But from a marketer's perspective, I see huge opportunities and huge advantages to the medium. Yeah, I mean, and I want to go back to kind of some of the challenges because you and I actually uh, discussed a few of them a little bit um, regarding how the, the format of mobile advertising and whether it could take the same um, – form as desktop advertising, but I would say that I think that there's an advantage with mobile advertising in the sense of um, of the context that you have. So when you have a mobile device, the um, huge advantage that mobile devices have is, is context. And what I mean by that is, con- is they, that your mobile device has context about pretty much everything uh, or in, in comparison to, say, um, a laptop or a or desktop computer. It knows where you are, so location-based context. Uh, it knows what time of the day it is, and, and of course, you know your desktop computer does, and such as well. But um, but tying the uh, where you are with what time of day it is makes a difference. Um, and you know, additionally, it also potentially has some uh, very personal data on there uh, in the form of you know most folks with their mobile devices have it personalized. There's personal information associated with profiles that are that are connected to your device. Um, there's there's a lot more context on a mobile device than I think most people realize. Um, external context and then context that you provide yourself as a user directly to your de- to your device, and those are all kind of prime opportunities and prime data points to to for 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 brands to advertise against. Sure, and I think you hit the nail on the head with the idea of. Even something as simple as combining time with location could be immensely popular. So let's say you are a single restaurant or maybe just you know one or two restaurants that, that have grouped together to form a chain of restaurants. And you're looking at this opportunity and saying, okay, well, I want to target mobile. What's my first step? So thinking through that a little bit and saying, okay, a phone knows where it is and what time it is. You could do something as targeted as saying, I only want to serve my ad to people that are within a five-mile radius of my restaurant, 
and I only want to serve it from the hours of 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. so that I'm hitting people that are within walking or driving distance, and it's lunchtime, so I know they're going to be out looking for food. I want to put my restaurant in front of them, maybe offer them a deal, maybe offer them an incentive, but it's really not that hard to do. I think that you know targeting to that level is is just scratching the surface of what's possible with mobile targeting, and I think that location and location-based marketing is going to be especially interesting as it relates to mobile because that's what people do. They take their phone out and they say, hey, I, I'm hungry for food or I'm looking for a place to shop or I want to go to a you know music store and buy a new CD. What's the closest thing around me? And so that actually segues nicely into another topic that I thought we should cover, which is the idea that Google has recently transitioned their Google local pages into Google+. And this is... You know, I guess not necessarily surprising. Google has been doing a lot of shoving into Google Plus and taking things and repurposing them and trying to basically make Google Plus the the one stop shop for all things social. But you know, Adam, what was your take on this decision to transition all of their local data and their their local business information into Google Plus and and just continue to build out this Google Plus social network with all of this you know potentially very valuable data? Well, I think first and foremost, a couple of things, because you, you usually ask me, so, hey, Adam, do you think Google Plus is a place people should go? <laughs> and and my, 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 my answer, I think, in at least two, two previous episodes has been um, not because there's droves and droves of people there at the moment, but because there is the potential um, by being associated with Google, by being connected and, and influential in relationship to Google search, um, amongst other things, it's a place where people should pay attention if it's even just simply going to get their websites found, um, for instance. And uh, the move to do the Google Plus Your World search results, um, that, you know, the search tie-in um, that we talked also about some time ago uh, if that doesn't let you know that Google's moving in that direction and is really playing a lot of their cards and, and has a long-term strategy for Google+, Plus, then moving their places pages into the app does. Uh, it's a for sure thing that tells you these guys, these guys are not playing around. They're taking something that's actually a pretty serious monetizable area uh, because, it, and I think it was just recently where I was reading 20% of uh, I think it was 20% of mobile web usage is related to searching for location-based information or, or associated with, with, with looking at location-based information. So restaurants and stores and things like that. And so in, in this sense, um, they, they, a lot of companies, including Apple, but, but Google sees places as being an opportunity to monetize on top of those, to make recommendations, and that's why they were going for Yelp in the past. Uh, and in fact, that's also something that they could have used Groupon when they were reaching out and, and making a deal for, for Groupon as well. And so this is their move to say, well, look, we have these places, and these places are associated with, with usually, obviously, storefronts and companies. So we're going to take that and we're going to put, put it now and tie it directly into Google+. Plus which makes Google Plus even more of a hub and gives us even more of a reason to show Google Plus related information in search results, whether people are looking for location-based information or they're looking for just general information about, you know, a brand or a celebrity or whoever might be, uh, might have a Google Plus page. So this is a pretty serious thing, I think. Um, it's quite interesting and it causes, um, I think it's, it's, an, it's it makes, it should make brands and, and businesses take notice and now pay even more attention to creating um, Google Plus brand pages and associating them with their places pages or, or with their with their locations pages now, which were formerly places pages now in Google Plus. <laughs> there you go. It's a complicated world over there at Google. Exactly. I, I imagine some sort of giant map drawn on the wall of here's all of our things and here's what's made the transition and here's what's not and here's what we call it and, you know, don't screw up. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't know if you've checked it out, but it's actually, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I didn't get to poke around a lot so far. Uh, I, took a, I took a look at some of my, my favorite uh, spots 
and, um, you know, kind of checked out the information that they had, which was really interesting. Um, and the thing that I, uh, I, well, I'm using the word interesting a lot, but the thing that I find interesting is that I think a lot of these brands, a lot of these businesses, especially like, for instance, I was checking out my favorite coffee shop. They have no idea that that's what happened to their places page. And I guarantee you that a significant amount of traffic, it goes to their places page, you know, in addition to, to their Yelp page, which I'm sure that they pay some attention to, but, um, usually Google places pages and Yelp pages are, are pretty, um, uh, prominent in results. And, uh, so now I wonder what it'll take for folks to take note and to kind of, um, uh, claim their pages because there's an area on those pages to claim it and to then now, you know, to curate it and to probably um, associate it with their Google Plus profile overall. And, you know, I think as always, we our sort of go to recommendation for companies looking to get involved in this is go and check out the information that's about your page that's there. See if it's accurate, see if it needs updating, and make sure, because especially with something like Google, that's where a huge number of your potential customers are going to go to find out about you, find out how to get to your place of business, find out what hours you're open, you know, anything they can they can look for is hopefully going to be found inside of what used to be Google Locations and is now the Google Plus page. So, you know, check that out, see what's there for your business, and make sure that it's at least, at the very least, accurate and hopefully, you know, portrays your company in a very positive light. Yeah, claim your page, make sure it's accurate, all that stuff, which you should be doing with pretty much any, uh, pro- any, any, um, what do you want to say? Any prominent location page that's out there, you know, paying attention to what's on Yelp and, and other uh, location, maybe more niche uh, location based services that are out in your area. You know, we have Merchant Circle and uh, a few others that are out here. Yeah. So, Adam, to round out this discussion on mobile and its general trends and general increase that we are seeing What's your take on the idea that the next Facebook or the the big Facebook competitor that we all imagine at some point is going to appear because, hey, you know, MySpace didn't live forever, so maybe Facebook won't either. But maybe the next Facebook competitor is a mobile-only product. And, you know, we saw how they reacted very quickly to Instagram when Instagram posed even just you know, the the very beginnings of a threat to their network. And they said, oh, you know, before that happens, we got to buy them up and make sure that, hey, if it works, it works, and we own it, and that works. But at the very least, we want to take out what could be our most credible threat. And Instagram was a mobile-only network. And so I think we're And then they went ahead and released basically a similar thing (laughs) uh, within, you know, a couple months after that. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, they were obviously well aware of mobile, though, you know, people do question Facebook's mobile tactics. They're sort of piecemealing all of their apps out into separate functionality rather than doing one core Facebook app. So, you know, some people agree with that, some people don't. But I think the main issue at hand here is do you think that the next credible social network and the next credible way that we are going to interact with one another is going to be a, you know, as yet unreleased mobile based social network that because of the rise in mobile, unless Facebook gets their act together and suddenly hops on the mobile bandwagon and starts putting out apps that are, you know, above and beyond anything we've ever seen before, somebody else is going to swoop in and, you know, over the course of a couple years, take the social network out from under them and and become the dominant force in mobile, which, you know, as we're sort of hinting at, mobile could become the dominant force in the internet use in general. So if you're the social network that owns mobile and Facebook doesn't get their act together on mobile, you could easily, you know, become the the thing that poses a significant threat to Facebook. What's your take on that? Do you subscribe to that theory or do you think that that's a, a bunch of Huey? Well, so in 2000, 20, 2010, I think it was, when we were leading into 2011, I think every time we saw anybody, whether it be from Google or Facebook, um, specifically talking uh, talk about what their strategy was or what they were forecasting for the next year, they both said, we are going to focus like a huge, huge amount of resources on mobile. 
Uh, I'm sure you remember that. And so they were just saying mobile is where we're going to focus. And and quite honestly, I think uh, I was a bit underwhelmed in regards to how much they pressed forward with it. And I think maybe a lot of it has to do with strategically thinking about mobile rather than actually putting out you know, solutions and platforms and, 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 and things and, uh, um, apps and uh, things associated with their web platforms on mobile devices. Um, but I, I'm starting to see it moving in that direction this year. I think the difference between say a Facebook and a, um, uh, and a, and say a MySpace is that, so a couple quick things. One, MySpace was using, you know, you could be anybody you want on MySpace. You use whatever name you want. I, there is a, there is a power associated with using your real identity on Facebook that ends up being transferred, um, almost as a, an identification, a, a kind of a, an official identification system across the web onto other uh, apps and platforms and services that decide to use Facebook's data. So, you know, I won't go into it too much, but Airtime, for instance, was just released yesterday, which is a new startup from uh, Sean Parker, um, and one of the guys that actually was part of Facebook as well. And, you know, he essentially, in a way, in my mind, rehashed another startup chat roulette that had an issue with using, uh, had an issue with people like abusing the system um, and being kind of in a way anonymous on the site and kind of doing lewd and crude things. Well, he's trying to leverage Facebook as an identification system so that they know who you are because in order to sign up, you have to use Facebook. So I think that that's one thing Facebook has going for it is right now it is used and Google is starting to more and more as well be, but it's used as the kind of the DMV of of the web, and, and, and you know, for, for the sake of saying, it's where you get your ID and where you use it across the web. Uh, and then the other quick thing is, is in relation to that, Facebook has also kind of permeated as a platform across the entire web. So it isn't just so the open graph data that it uses is across the entire web. It is not just in its own, you know, closed doors and its walled garden. It's just everywhere. I mean, we covered it a couple of months ago. Um, that it was the most uh, common social sign-in system used uh, on other on other websites, and so those two things I think make sure that Facebook has kind of an enduring opportunity here to kind of screw up a few times before it it it, it does does well. Now I will say that right now they have some kludgy things going on with their mobile apps. They have some conflicting things going on with the fact that it's got, you know, there's Instagram and there's that community. And then they go and release something that's very Instagram ish, uh, on their own platform. Um, but all in all, I think that they still have time to make their mobile. What they need to do is they need to make sure that their mobile app can satiate the appetites of folks enough so that if they never did anything ever on their desktop computer or ever even own a laptop or desktop computer, they could be just as active in Facebook, which is, is uh, not, I wouldn't say far from the case already. There's a lot of folks that are just predominantly mobile and are on Facebook a lot, just predominantly on their mobile devices. But as the global adoption of smartphones rises, they have to provide the opportunity for folks who will never buy a desktop computer or never care to their desktop computer usage is is a is a minority is the minority of the time. If if you know I would be surprised if it would be less than five percent of the computing time or the, the the media consumption time for some of these individuals across the globe, not just predominantly in the US. And and that's the future, I believe, of computing is going to be less and less people who are going to go to their desktops and go to their laptops. And we're talking, you know, maybe not a year from now, but two, three, four years from now. And I, I think I think even forecasting that far ahead matters for for folks like Facebook. Uh, you are you a Path user? No, I am not. So you don't use Path at all? Nope. Okay, so. When Path came out with the version 2.0, you know, there was a few discussions, myself, you know, myself uh, being one of the folks who was discussing that there was the potential where Path could do the same thing where, what, it, what that Instagram did, where somehow it just ended up cl- clicking with a few folks and took off. And Path, is, for those that don't know about it, is a strictly m- mobile uh, social network initially only allowing you to connect with 50 people. So it was supposed to be a place where it was a little bit more private. You were connecting only with, you know, your, your more close friends and constituents and so all that stuff. Um, and I think they raised it to like a hundred and 150, you know, people, uh, uh, 
cap. But it's actually pretty interesting, the interactions that happen on there. I don't go on it a lot. I usually, to be honest, forget that it's on my phone um, because it's not like a go-to place that I go to. But there's a, an affinity that I have for it. But I, I've seen it take off only with probably like the techies and the early adopters. And, and I don't know if it's taken off with folks. Other than that, uh, personally, I haven't looked at the data behind it. I know that they've had a pretty good uh, um, pretty good kind of acceleration of adoption, but I, I think it's kind of the first beyond Instagram. It's the first kind of look at what could a mobile only network do, or or how could it feel, and and could it be uh, could it be popular? And I think it's still proving itself in that regard. Yeah. So you know, for those people out there who maybe aren't super familiar with path definitely check that out i've i played around with it a little bit i'm just not an active user but it does have at least the seed of what a mobile only social network could look like so if you want to get a feel for what the potential facebook dethroner could look like take a look at path though i think at this point it's probably not going to reach that critical mass just because of the fact that it's it's been out for a while and it doesn't seem to have that that secret magical sauce that makes something explode in the way that Instagram does, but still we're checking out just to see some of the the neat things they're doing. And when it comes to brands and such, it's not necessarily. I mean, it, by by no means is it really a place for brands to go on there and market themselves and so on. There, you know, there's opportunities on some place, on Instagram. We've talked about them in the past, um, but to engage with folks there, there are a few celebrities that are using Path. But of course, again, with that cap that that that's that's on that, it's almost like a velvet rope of places where you may allow only certain people to come connect with you and interact with those folks and give them kind of a behind the scenes view that nobody else could get. But beyond that, it really uh, is not made to kind of be a, a, a place where you can you can grow a mass audience of people to engage with and kind of serendipitously discover new folks to connect with. So let's move on because I think that we have definitely discussed quite a few interesting things there and we've probably overwhelmed our audience with that, though, with stats and thoughts and, and things to examine. So What I want to do next is actually look at a specific tool. And so Adam and I have talked about this, and what we're going to aim to do over the next couple of shows is review at least one tool per week. And so this week, what we're going to look at is a service called Level Up. And Level Up is very similar to Square, which many people are likely familiar with. It's basically a way to pay for things using your smartphone. And the difference is that Level Up actually uses phone-to-phone communication. So when you're using it, you load up the app, and it actually has a custom QR code that is then read by a reader at the merchant. So if you've ever used the Starbucks card application, it's a very similar process where you're, you're showing this thing on your screen that a reader can then read. It transmits data to a central server and says, hey, Corey has now paid, you know, $10 for lunch. His bill's covered. Thank you for your, you know... Thank you for visiting this restaurant. So there's a couple interesting things that I think set Level Up apart. And I will say from the get-go that I'm a huge fan of Square. I think that, you know, the things Square is doing with loyalty programs and geolocation are fantastic. But if you're a brand that has already jumped on the Square bandwagon, it might be worth checking out Level Up as well. Because they're doing some things differently that I think have some great opportunity to engage another audience that's that's very smartphone friendly and very forward thinking. So the first of which is that Level Up is extremely focused on loyalty. So when you first get the app, you can actually load it up and all the places around you will have specific prepaid discounts. And I think this is actually something that Level Up is putting money towards in order to increase use of their app. But basically Everywhere you go, the first time you use Level Up, you'll save, you know, $2 or $3 or $5 off your first purchase. So right then and there, it's incentivizing people to go out, you know, try new things. You're, you're saving a couple bucks off. It's encouraging people to use Level Up. But then taking that a step further, it actually sets goals. So it says, hey, if you return here and you spend a total of $50, we'll give you $5 off the subsequent purchase. And so it's incentivizing people to remain loyal to their favorite restaurant, their favorite store, their favorite food truck, return, you know, keep track of, hey, here's how often I've been here. Oh, it turns out I I do love this taco truck. Maybe I should check it out this week. And um, so I think 
In terms of consumer loyalty, that is not something that I've really seen other apps do, but I think it's very powerful. The other thing that they did recently is they actually debuted outdoor billboards that feature a QR code-based coupon system. I think this is really interesting because my typical reaction to QR code is... I hate it. I don't, I'm not a big fan of QR codes. I don't think they work well. I think that the dream of getting mass adoption in the U.S. is going to remain a dream. But in this case, I think it works because you're targeting level up users, which means you can already pretty safely assume that they're going to have the level up app. So they load that up and inside of the level up app, it has a scanner. So you can scan this QR code and it's basically saying, hey, scan this QR code and save $5 off your next purchase. Now, what's great about this is that out-of-home billboard can exist within, you know, walking distance of a store or at least within the general neighborhood that the store where you're redeeming it is. So somebody sees this, they scan it, it says, hey, that restaurant is only, you know, two blocks down the road. You should go check it out because you're you're going to save five bucks. What's not to like about that? So I can definitely see, see users experimenting with level up saying hey this is easy to use i i like the process it's helping me you know trim down my wallet i don't have to carry around all these cards i can just carry around my phone that i'm already using so you know i wouldn't necessarily call it a better option than square but i think it's different enough that it's worth exploring and it's worth checking out and you know it I mentioned that Square is doing cool stuff with geolocation. I will give a nod to Level Up, which is doing really cool things with data entry. So when you, as a new user, when you set up an account, you actually just scan the front of your credit card and that automatically adds it to the system. So you don't have to type all the numbers and potentially mistype things. It it just reads the front of your credit card, says, is this data correct? You say yes, and then it deletes that photo so you don't have to worry about security. But you know, I thought that was a really neat sort of technological hurdle that they overcame for users. So, you know, I I think that I'm very bullish on the idea of mobile phones replacing the wallet. I think that with Square, with Level Up, it just adds things to the experience that a wallet and just paying with cash or credit card doesn't. So check Level Up out, see if it might be a fit for your business. And at the very least, take a look at both Level Up and Square for the direction that, in my opinion, shopping and and exchanging money between a customer and a business is going to be going in the future. Uh, so are we going to move into our newly uh, kind of approved lightning round session that you spontaneously uh, made up last week? <laughs> yes. So speaking of things that we are going to try to repeat episode after episode, I hear him reaching for his uh, timer over there. There you go. I got it queued up with one minute, uh, one minute on the clock. So basically what we're going to do is cover three stories and we're going to do that in 60 seconds or less. So the idea is somebody will explain the story in 60 seconds, and then the other person will have a chance to respond to that in 60 seconds or less, which means that in the course of six minutes, you will have three separate stories with two opinions on that story uh, combining together to really get a lot of valuable information out there in a short amount of time. So, Or a lot of blabber because we only got 60 seconds to say <laughs> it. But I, I, will, I will cover the last thing since I'm familiar with that, and I will let you go for the first two. All right, that sounds good. I will start the clock now. So the first up is a magazine called Snap Mag, and this was actually put out by Hipstamatic, which you may remember as one of the larger competitors to Instagram. And why I think this is interesting is, one, it promotes the use of Hipstamatic. So it's basically a photo-based magazine that all the photos are shot with Hipstamatic, but it's also a potential revenue driver. So for Hipstamatic, instead of saying, how do we sell another lens or how do we sell another copy of the app? They said, let's rethink our business model. Let's look at ourselves as not just the seller of an app, but also the seller of a lifestyle and the seller of, you know, a a content distribution method that people would want to actually pay to participate in. So I think it's a great revenue driver for them. It's a great sort of brand builder because you're seeing these photos. You're like, oh, this is so cool. I want to have the Hipstamatic app. I want to take photos like that. It really caters to a specific audience. And so in my mind, huge win for Hipstamatic and, you know, potentially something that other apps could emulate. Right on time. All right, Adam, I'm starting the 60 second clock. What's your thoughts on SnapMag? Man, w- would you be mad at me if I were to say that somebody was pinging me on Facebook right now and uh, I didn't get to listen a lot to what you just said? <laughs> 
Well, uh, in that case, we'll say that your 10-second response is everything Corey said was perfect, and we can move on to the next story. Uh, actually, I would add to that that the way you said hipstamatic, it rolled off the tongue so much that it almost sounded like you were doing it hip-hop style. You said <laughs> you said hipstamatic, and it just sounded like you know it was hipster, but you just gave it that little that little uh, street you know slang there. So uh, kudos for you on that. All right, there you go. Well, I'm I'm stealing your bonus time on the next story. <laughs> awesome. Let's go for it. Uh, all right, so next I will story. Listen. I will. I promise I'll listen this time. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, here we go. Timer is set and diving in. So the next story is Ben and Jerry's scoop truck. And this is actually something that I wanted to bring up when we were talking about food trucks because I think it's interesting that Ben and Jerry's is a bigger brand. It's not something that, you know, it's a single food truck roaming around. But what they said is, all right, food trucks are working. How do we adapt our larger mainstream brand to this food truck movement so they basically put some unique flavors in a food truck traveled around the country went to these different food truck establishments and places at food trucks park and said hey you know here's a chance to experiment with some of our new flavors come enjoy the ben and jerry's brand come meet some of our brand ambassadors you're having a good experience you're not feeling like it's a big brand anymore. Suddenly, Ben & Jerry's feels like this very down-home, very local, very you know consumer-friendly brand. I love the idea that they're experimenting with food trucks. They recognize the trend. They found an easy way to integrate with that trend. I think this is a huge win, and I'd love to see other brands follow in their footsteps. And with that, I save myself two extra seconds. All right, Adam. 60 seconds on the clock. What's your take on the Ben & Jerry's scoop truck? Well... I think that they are seeing the trend that we saw uh, and the reason that we went to the Soma street food uh, place, right? And uh, in fact, they're not just uh, moving in the direction of, of food trucks, but they're also adopting kind of the tactics that the food trucks have found successful in uh, in helping promote their food trucks and in taking advantage of kind of the different kind of mobile medium. You know, we talked about mobile a lot during this episode, and uh, it's kind of no 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 joke, no pun intended, that we also talked about mobile food trucks uh, because that the, the mobile element really played a lot into how they've now been able to kind of catch on fire. Uh, and so Ben and Jerry's is really interestingly taking that their their big brand and moving it in the direction of uh, a lot of these, you know, more small, agile uh, entrepreneurs that are um, fueling them, fu- fueling the uh, food truck movement. All right. And you yourself also had four bonus seconds. So congratulations. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So with that, we will close up the lightning round. But hopefully, again, a couple of interesting stories, a couple of quick uh, opinions on those. So stories. we're skipping mine. We're going to skip that last one. Oh, you know what? I totally, uh, I did skip yours. But I mean, let's, is, let's that, is that penalizing me for, uh, <laughs> for not paying attention to the very first one? There you go. That's that's actually penalizing me for misordering these on the schedule of things we were going to go through. So you are correct. We should definitely do yours. So I will put sixty seconds back on the clock right. and cracking let the me knuckles, know stretching out the arms, ready you when you like. are ready. Go. All right. So this one is about the Sprint Dream Maker. And funny enough, is a couple weeks ago, I actually wanted to cover this and could not find a story on it in order to help provide some context. But what's going on is before movies, uh, you are usually told to turn off your cell phone. And what Sprint does is it says, you know, you should turn off your cell phone. And just before you do, in order to see what happens when your cell phone is put to sleep, what it dreams about, text dream to this particular number. And when you turn your phone back on, we will show you what your phone dreamed about. And so uh, I went through the, the whole thing and just recently last week, you turn it off and then after you turn it back on, give it a little bit of time and then I send a text message back, actually connecting you to a link brings you to Facebook, ties a bunch of information together from your Facebook profile, and then it spits out kind of what seems to be this weird, lucid, kind of almost matrix and inception type of dream based on data that's on your Facebook account. Uh, and so the interesting thing about that is... is Oh, the interesting thing about that is you ran out of time. So. Boo, boo, <laughs> boo. But I'm sure you're going to bring some uh, some great wisdom with that. So it's your turn now. All right, 60 seconds on the clock starting now. So... First off, I got to start with the fact that this is a text based promotion, which I love. We said at the beginning of the episode that brands weren't taking advantage of the SMS platform enough. And so, you know, what do we see here? An example of a brand that says, hey, 
send a quick SMS message to us, we'll send back some valuable information. So I love that fact. I think it's great that Sprint has sort of evolved their movie theater sponsorship where, you know, they're really focusing on, hey, we're a phone company. We agree that a lot of people don't like phone companies because it's ruining their movie experience. So let's make the act of putting away our phone something fun, something to enjoy. I also like the idea that it's bringing in Facebook data. I think that Facebook has this huge wealth of information and the smart brands are looking at that and saying, okay, how do we pull even just small bits of that information into our own marketing efforts? Because that's going to give us a personalized experience that's both you know easy to create and easy to take part in as a consumer. So I'm a huge fan of this one. All right, 60 seconds on the dot. I like that. And I think it's actually something we could talk about a little bit more in the future because there's some interesting uh, additions to that. But uh, we are out of that in the lightning round and uh, we cannot go on. (laughs) And part of why we could actually discuss this in the future is that this was submitted to us by a reader. So if you remember back to last week, it seems like more than that, but it was just last week we were talking about how you could win tickets to the upcoming Social Loco Conference. And what we said is, just send us your favorite social, local, or mobile marketing campaign, and we'd pick one, we'd talk about it on the show, and we would give the person who submitted that to us a ticket to the event. And so this was actually sent to us by a Twitter user named Leslie Watson, who on her bio says she's from Santa Barbara, California, which puts her much closer than last than two weeks ago's winner. Who it was, was like on Mars, wasn't it, or something like that? <laughs> Mars, Ireland, you know, I think that they're was, pretty close to one another. Was it counterfeit beats? No, it was corp- corporate beats? Is that what uh, it was? Yeah, something like that. But uh, yeah, you know... We appreciate all our users, but unfortunately, I, I don't think we could give tickets to a California event to somebody that's in Ireland, but this is a user who or a listener who's in California could potentially take us up on the offer for free tickets to the Social Loco Conference. So because you brought that up, we you know added it to the lightning round. We started talking about it in brief, but I think we may actually revisit it at a future show because it definitely sounds like something that is worth diving into further. I think there's additional things that we could talk about that we couldn't fit into a short 60-second blurb. So uh, big thanks out to Leslie Watson for contributing that. We hope that the uh, two minutes of opinion that you got already was was interesting Doing enough. Adjusted, but, huh? <laughs> exactly. Justice. Doing it justice, but we will revisit that as a, at a future show as well to dive and, a little deeper. And we will reach out to you and get you the free ticket, but we want to make sure that we let all the rest of our listeners know that uh, there are tickets still available for Social Loco and that if you want the 25% off, go to purchase the tickets social-loco.net and you could use the promo code MP. Uh, M is in Mary and P is in Peter. Uh, Solo Mo twenty five, and uh, you will get twenty five percent off the ticket price uh, on our behalf. There you go. And because we are going to have one more episode between now and when the Social Loco conference occurs, we have one more ticket to give away. So I think what we're going to do for this week is keep it simple. So in order to win the ticket, all you have to do is send a tweet to at Solo Mo Show. That includes your location, or at least the general area with which you reside. And what we're going to do is, the first person to do so that lives within distance of the Social Loco Conference and could actually attend will win a ticket, will win a chance to both attend the event and also say hi to Adam and I, who will be at the Social Loco Conference. So Now we're just going to play and scare people away is what we're going to do, <laughs> telling them that. But, but, but the, so what we'll do, right, so if 100 people do that, what are we going to do? We're going to spin a wheel or something like that? We're going to throw darts at their names and... And how are we going to do that, Corey? Well, I was going to say the first, but I like your idea better. So if you're within distance of the Social Loco Conference, you have that day available and you're interested in going, just send us a tweet to at Solomosho with your general location. We'll include you in the pool. And if we have more than one entrant, we will draw names out of a hat in order to pick. How's that sound? And, and we will let's give a. I think the thing we hadn't done in the past that we probably should do is say by when. Uh, that we should uh, that the the folks should put it in by right. So we want it. We record normally on Tuesday evenings. This time we're we're a little off on that, but uh, essentially it should be before we record that Tuesday, so that way we could pick and announce the winner. Right? Winner, right? Yep. Yep. That sounds good. Okay. Awesome. 
All right, and uh, with that, I think we can wrap it up. So, as always, we want to give a huge thanks out to our audience, especially those that reach out and, and do say hi and do contribute to the show. But if you're out there, you're listening to it, we hope that you enjoy the information that we share. We hope that you get something out of it and that it enriches the marketing and advertising that you're doing because that's really what we're here for. So thanks again for listening, and we do hope that you you know get something of value out of the show. And if you do get something of value, we also hope that you share the show with others. And one of the best ways to do that is to rate the show in iTunes. So if you open up iTunes, search for Solo Mo Show, hopefully it will be the first result that pops up. And then... Go ahead and just give us a rating in iTunes, let people know what you think about the show, and that helps us to build the audience, get this out to more people, and, and you know, hey, if you're if you're out and talking about the Solo Mo Show, what better than to have other people say, hey, I listen to that too, and then you can talk about some of the things that we're talking about as well. So that's our, our request for you as an, as an audience member. Our goal is world domination, plain and simple. <laughs> there you go. So if you do want to get in touch, we highly encourage that. We love hearing from the listeners. So if you want to ask questions, suggest topics, give feedback, or even if you just want to say hi, feel free to do so. There's a number of ways to reach us. One of the easiest is probably Twitter. So at Solo Mo Show, again, is the address for the show. I'm available directly at Corey O'Brien. And I'm at Secret Sushi. We're also available via email, so that's solomoshow at gmail.com if you want to do it the old school way. And you can also connect with us on various social networks. So we have a Facebook page, a Google Plus profile, and a Pinterest board, all of which we share both the episodes from the show. And also, if you connect on Facebook, you get a little bit of behind the scenes. You'll see some photos. You'll see some links that we're discussing. So a great way to extend the solo mo discussion beyond just the weekly episode. Um, and then, as always, the links that we discussed today will be included in the show notes, which you can view by either going to solomoshow.com or just look around in your podcast player of choice. There should be an option to view show notes, and we include everything that we discussed. So it's an easy way to click, see the links that we're talking about, and actually play around with it as we discuss it. And hopefully that helps to enhance the show and make it a better experience for you as you're listening to it. Uh, and with that, we will call this episode a wrap and i think it was you know a fun episode overall we enjoyed going to the food truck uh event we hope that you enjoyed listening to it and our kind of take on that event we hope that uh that's something that we can do in the future so all the all the calories that i earned are all for the audience it was it was a <laughs> sacrifice for the show there you go we did it for you so uh with that we'll call it a wrap and we will see you guys next week take care <laughs>